One of the dominant models of international trade theory is the Pecturoline framework. Now, this is a version of a neoclassical model. In other words, we'll have opportunity costs increasing as production uh, rises. But it looks at a particular reason for international trade, mutually beneficial trade, occurring between uh, two countries. It's going to be based on the supplies of the primary factors, capital and labor, land, skilled labor, unskilled labor, various combinations of these primary factors serving as the, the main reason why countries might want to trade with each other. So I want to lay out in this video some of the basic assumptions and intuition that goes with the model. Then in a separate video I want to take a look at this in a more um, analytical framework using uh, production possibility frontiers. So the first assumption that's made is that the two countries share the same technologies. They're identical technologies in the countries that are trading. Now that's not, a, not meant to be realistic. It's designed to eliminate that as a basis for trade. If you recall from the Ricardian model, we've already shown that differences in technologies are a basis uh, for trade. So we don't need to have that in a, an additional complication in the hector Orlean model. We can set that aside. We also assume that there are identical tastes, identical demand conditions in the two countries. Not because it's realistic, but because we want to eliminate differences in taste as a basis for trade. There's a separate video for that. So again, we're setting aside the, these, um, these alternative reasons why countries might want to trade. What you do assume is that countries have different relative factor endowments. Now typically, the assumption is made in the neoclassical framework that there is, there are two types of endowment, capital and labor. Now this is not the only way you can divide up uh, these primary factors, but this is the standard one. So when we say that there are different relative factor endowments, for example, if the capital stock compared to the labor stock, the total amounts of capital and total amounts of labor in country A exceeds the capital stock divided by the labor stock in country B, they have different relative factor endowments. And as a consequence, there are going to be implications for what countries have have the ability to export profitably in the, in the international market. So we have these basic assumptions about the difference, differences in, uh, in relative factor endowments, identical taste, identical technologies. So keep those in mind. And we also are assuming that there are different factor intensities in the two goods. separate video about this as well. We're going to assume that good X is the capital intensive uh, good. Please take a look at that, the relevant video. And we've got a labor intensive good Y. And again, the capital labor endowment for country A exceeds the capital labor endowment for country B. So they have these two different types of goods and two different supplies for the two goods. 
So let me lay out the basic intuition about the implications of all of these, these assumptions. The basic intuition behind the Heckscher-Ohlin model. First, if you have large relative supply of capital, say, okay, this is one example. So if you've got a, you're like country A, you've got a large relative supply of capital. That's going to result in a low relative price of capital in the country. You know, so lots of capital means capital is cheap. If you have lots of labor, labor will be cheap. So once you have this low relative price of capital, that's going to make it cheap to produce a capital intensive good so that you will have a comparative adva advantage in X. So, once again, the basic intuition, if you've got, if you're have a large endowment of a factor, it's going to make this factor cheap. It's going to then be cheap to produce goods that intensively use that abundant factor. And if that's the case, then you will have a comparative advantage in that good. And it opens up the possibilities for mutually beneficial trade. So this is the sort of basic overview and intuition about hexerolene. In subsequent videos, we'll really lay out the, uh, the particulars of this model. But here's the, the basic assumptions and intuitions associated with